Being right means deliverance from death. What? Absolutely. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV. We're taking you through the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. We're doing that again this year. It's exciting. Today, we're going to focus in on some specific verses, about 11 verses, as we take a look a little bit at what we're studying. So it's going to be very good. Corey is here. Corey with uh, Ryan. Go ahead. Today is a little bit of a continuation from yesterday's program where we looked at the Silver Scroll amulets. Today, we're looking at where those were actually found. Ryan? Today, we're going to sit down at Lady Wisdom's Banquet. Wow, that's great. Excellent. Look forward to that. All coming up in about 20 minutes time. Janice? Be a gatherer. All right. <laughs> Be a gatherer. There you go. To take your Bible guide. Go to today's passage as we begin to study this because it's going to be good. Let's open up the Bible. Proverbs 10, verses 1 through 11. The Proverbs of Solomon A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is the grief of his mother. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivers from death. The Lord will not allow the righteous soul to famish, but he casts away the desire of the wicked. He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a wise son. He who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. Blessings are on the head of the righteous, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. The memory of the righteous is blessed, but the name of the wicked will rot. The wise in heart will receive commands, but a prating fool will fall. He who walks with integrity walks securely, but he who perverts his ways will become known. He who winks with the eye causes trouble, but a prating fool will fall. The mouth of the righteous is a well of life, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. Proverbs chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. Proverbs chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11 three chapters. And this is interesting as we read through the Bible, but it's important to remember that we're looking at Proverbs 10, 1 through 11 today. Righteousness, it's a big religious word, isn't it? What does righteousness mean when defined in the Bible? It means right with God. Right with God, that's right. So someone who is considered to be righteous is someone who is right with God. This is a great place to be in our life right with God. But there are many who don't care. Again, this is where taking God's advice is a problem because we need to learn that God's commands are given to us in the form of what seems to be God's advice. The Lord is perfect and therefore communicates perfectly. Proverbs chapter 10 contains saying that teach us what it means to be right with God. As we meditate on God's words, remember that God is giving us more than just advice. We should listen to the deeper meaning of what God is saying so that we can apply it to our life. A reader who does that is right with God. He is righteous. Keep that in mind. Today, righteousness. We're going to talk about being right with God. And uh, here's the Bible guide. Check it out. If you don't have your Bible guide, uh, you can get it. We'll send it to you. Call us or write to us. Or you can actually go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click on it. When you click on it, it does take you to a donate page. Thank you for your donations. We really appreciate them. They help us tremendously. And then it takes you to a place where you can download it, just like it's printed. So it's a PDF file. 
And uh, so you can get a hold of yours and join us. Seconds, I tell you, you're seconds away. But as we look at Proverbs chapter 10, let's pray. Father, I ask today that as we read your word, it's your word, that the Holy Spirit would help us. Help us to listen to you, Holy Spirit. We need to hear you. Thank you, Father, for all that you're doing. And be with everybody who's listening to me. In the name of Jesus Christ, and we said together, amen and amen. Okay, as we look at Proverbs chapter 10, this gets really interesting. Let's see this. The Proverbs of Solomon, okay? A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is the grief of his mother. There's a lot there, okay? A wise father and grief of his mother. Look at those two. Very important. There's a lot of comparisons you can do, but keep that in mind. Treasures of wickedness. They profit nothing. But rightness with God delivers from death. There's a lot there too. Number three, the Lord will not allow the righteous, the right with God's soul to famish, but he cast away the desire of the wicked. Now there's, these are three verses which are stunning. What we learn is being right with God brings deliverance from death. Being right with God brings deliverance from death. The Lord came to earth, taught us how to be right and live for him. That's exactly what Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach did when he was here 2000 years ago. That's why he lived with us for that period of time. That's why he allowed himself to be tortured by us and kill him. He allowed that because he knew that he could overcome death. And in fact, he did on the third day, came to life in the flesh, seen by over 500 men. Very interesting. And people now follow him. And when they follow him, he brings his Holy Spirit to them. That's being right with God. Follow the Lord. Proverbs chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. This is interesting. And here's what it says. It says, he who has a slack hand becomes poor. In other words, he who doesn't do anything becomes poor. But the hand of the diligent makes rich. The hand that works. In other words, you got to work. He who gathers in the summer is a wise son. But he who sleeps in the harvest is a son who causes shame. This is the reward of work. Hard work and practical wisdom is rewarded. Hard work and practical wisdom is rewarded. That's what God said. As Christians or Christ followers, we should live wisely for the glory and the honor of God. I like to say to people, when I work, I, I work as if I'm working for the Lord. That's what I do. Beloved, we need to work that way. We need to put ourselves forth and say, Father, I, I need to work. And there, because there's other people that they don't work. I don't know what's wrong because God made us to work. He gave Adam and Eve back before sin, the garden to take care of. Then he removed the garden after they sinned. Nevertheless, God made us to work, beloved. So we need to work. That doesn't mean we go crazy and burn ourselves out. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the desire to work to live. Now that's important. Keep that in mind. That's what God says to us. Also, Proverbs 10, 6 to 11, blessings are on the head of the righteous, the one right with God, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. Violence covers the mouth of the wicked. The memory of the righteous is blessed, but the name of the wicked will rot. That's amazing. The memory of the righteous? Absolutely. The wise in heart will receive commands, but a prating fool will fall. He who walks with integrity walks securely, but he who perverts his way will become known. He who winks with the eye causes trouble, but a prating fool will fall. And the last verse, 
the mouth of the righteous, the mouth of the one right with God is a well of life. But the violence covers the wicked. There is a difference here between those who are righteous and those who are not. There is a vast difference between those who are right with God and those who are not. God makes it clear that how we choose to live will affect our eternity. There were some people about 30 years ago who got a hold of this, and they were people who always talked positive. You never talked negative. And you can take that too far because you got to talk honest. <laughs> so when you talk honest, there are some things that are not positive happening in this world. But let's remember that while those things are happening, we know what will happen. What will happen is God will seize control of the earth. God will take control of the earth and there will be good times. If you're a Christian, if you're somebody who believes in Jesus Christ, somebody who knows the Lord, rest be assured, number one, you're going to live forever and I'll meet you in eternity. So uh, all of the people that I can't see now because of television, we can see you in eternity. But nevertheless, we have to understand that God will rule. And when God rules, rightness comes into swing with God. It's going to get better. It's going to get better through Jesus Christ. It's going to get better through Yeshua, HaMashiach, in Jesus' name. It's time now to carry on with our Bible study, and our assigned reading today is Proverbs 9 to 11. And my specific focus is Proverbs 9, in which wisdom is portrayed as a woman holding a banquet. And as you're probably aware, the imagery here is very significant and points to greater spiritual realities. So let's dig into the Word of God. In Proverbs 9, we find Lady Wisdom preparing a banquet for those who are simple and have no sense. In her preparations, she has slaughtered her meat, mixed her wine, and furnished her table. Certainly, this proverb pictures a very special occasion. Indeed, in the ancient East, freshly butchered meat was a mark of a feast. And we also notice that Wisdom's wine isn't typical either, but has been mixed or mingled. Just what this drink refers to exactly isn't known, but there are some cultural clues. For example, some scholars believe that this means wine diluted with water, which was a common practice in the ancient world. In fact, wine was diluted with water as much as 1 to 8 to reduce its power to intoxicate. It has been claimed that in most, if not all, cases where mixed wine is spoken of in the Bible, wine mingled with water is meant. In support of this claim, Isaiah 121 is often cited, where the prophet declares, Thy silver is become dross, thy wine mixed with water. But Isaiah here is speaking not of wine which is ordinarily drank at feasts, but of wine that is deteriorated in quality. God's people had become debased, they were like wine mixed with water. Furthermore, there are several biblical passages that speak of mixed wine that seem to refer to wine that has been strengthened, not weakened. Based upon this, some suggest that the mixed wine of Proverbs 9 refers simply to old wine that has been stored in jars and has become strong from mingling with its own sediments. However, the majority of scholars believe that this wine was mixed with spices and other ingredients to give it a better and more appealing taste. This view appears to have the most cultural support. For instance, according to the 19th century reverend James Freeman, the Greeks and Latins always understood mixed wine to be wine diluted with water, but the Hebrews generally understood it to mean wine made stronger and more intoxicating by the addition of other ingredients such as honey, spices, myrrh, mandragora, opiates, other drugs, and even boiled down reductions of the wine itself. Also, based upon the celebratory feast setting of Proverbs 9, it would seem that the mixed or mingled wine here does indeed refer to wine mixed with additional ingredients in order to make it tastier. 
a conclusion also fully in line with the original Hebrew language. Indeed, the definition of the Hebrew word here, translated mixed or mingled, means to mingle or mix, especially wine with spices. Thus culturally, contextually, and etymologically, this view is consistent, and it even makes sense from a scriptural perspective. The food and drink offered by wisdom is the very same food and drink offered by Christ Jesus, which is his body and blood. This feast is an image of the kingdom of God, and so we would certainly expect it not only to look and smell attractive, but also to be of the highest quality and taste. So in this proverb, we see an invitation to eternal life, the very same invitation Jesus Christ gives to each and every one of us. Just as wisdom invites us in to eat of her food and drink of her wine, so does Christ invite us in to eat of his bread and drink of his wine, which is his body and blood. And don't get confused, this isn't physical food and drink, it's spiritual. It's spiritually consuming the fact that Jesus Christ, a holy and perfect God, bled and died for your sins. He became a substitute for you and me because as sinful human beings, we can never make it to heaven on our own. But this isn't just intellectually believing that Jesus died and rose again. It's personally accepting that transaction that Jesus made on your behalf. That's why John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's not just believing in him intellectually, but it's believing on or into him. It's accepting the transaction of Jesus's life for yours. He's offered you the gift of salvation, but only you can accept it. And the question is, will you do that today if you haven't? Because time is short. And the way you do that is really interesting because as you focus on this, uh, it, 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 if you're somebody who does not know Jesus Christ, but you wanna know him, you simply say, pray to God. And you say, well, pray, how do you pray? Well, you just talk to God. Some people close their eyes to lock out the world around them and they focus on God. And you just say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I'm a sinner. I don't do things right. I need your forgiveness. Come into my heart, be the Lord of my life. And I believe that he killed you 2000 years ago. You allowed us to do that pay the cost of sin. And Lord, we believe that you came to life in the flesh. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you are serious about that prayer, then God will help you for sure. And uh, he will take you on. It's very, very important. I did it 46 years ago and it's the best thing I ever did. So anyway, thank you. It's very good. Keep an eye on the word of God. That's him talking to you. Corey. All right, well, today is a continuation of what we started to look at on yesterday's program. Yesterday's program, we, look at, we looked at uh, the, this discovery of the silver scroll amulets, but today we're going to be focusing in on the site where they were found. They were found in a tomb context, meaning that they were burial, they were buried with uh, the people uh, that, that, that passed on, that they had belonged to during their lives. Uh, so Ketef Hinnom, this, this site, is important for more than just the silver scroll amulets. So take a look. In modern day Jerusalem, a hill named Ketef Hinnom has yielded important archaeological finds. Ketef Hinnom means the shoulder of Hinnom, as it's located on the escarpment rising from the Hinnom Valley across from the old city of Jerusalem. Excavations between 1975 and 96 explored burial caves as well as a Byzantine church. And while the area had been used as a quarry during the Turkish Ottoman period, resulting in extensive damage, the site has still produced rich finds. The church has been identified as St. George Outside the Walls, a church built for Christian pilgrims as they journeyed along the road between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. According to an historical source, many Christian clergymen were murdered here in the Persian invasion of Christian Jerusalem. Below the remains of the church, archaeologists discovered cremation remains and a stamped roof tile, evidence of the 10th Roman legion who are known to have been stationed in Jerusalem for a couple hundred years from the time of the destruction of the temple onwards. Even earlier still, many graves were explored from the Second Temple period and several tombs from the First Temple period. These rock-cut tombs show evidence of continued use into the Roman period, with artifacts ranging from decorative beads to signet seals and cooking pots. 
The ceilings of the tombs had been quarried away in ancient times, but the burial benches and general layouts of the tombs have been left intact. In these and other Judean tombs from the first temple period, rock-cut benches, sometimes with headrests showing the orientation the deceased would have been laid, provided space for the decomposition of the body. Once decomposed, family members would collect the bones and grave goods from the bench and deposit them in a bone repository, often located under one of the benches, to make way for more burials. In one tomb, archaeologists discovered a bone repository that was intact, untouched by looters thanks to rock debris that had covered it for thousands of years. Within it, the remains of 95 people were found, along with over a thousand artifacts and the largest collection of jewelry found to date. This repository also yielded the now famous Silver Scroll Amulets. You know, looking at burial goods and even just burial practices of ancient peoples is extremely helpful. It's helpful even today, you know, if you're trying to understand what a culture values or what a specific family or specific people value, you look at how they're taken care of once they die and what they're buried with. And there's all sorts of really interesting uh, elements to, to pick apart. And there's been many, many studies done by scholars and historians and archeologists on this. And it's really interesting to be able to scratch the surface here with Katefinum. That is excellent, very good. And let me just say briefly that Love Life is an organization that loves life. And uh, lovelife.org is about this organization. You can go there. I know the people, it's great. Uh, they're headquartered in Charlotte, North Carolina. They're great, uh, it is excellent. Churches need to get involved with this and uh, I would encourage you to do so. So make sure that you do that. This is the week that they're dedicating uh, Kevin Bateman. Uh, his church in Queens, New York, is dedicating this week to the time that they spend on it. So that's really good. Excellent. We're looking for Kevin Bateman is great, great he guy. Is. Anyway, go ahead, Jen. All right. I entitled my segment today, Be a Gatherer. As I was reading Proverbs chapter 10 and all of the wise sayings, I got down to verse 5. And it got me to thinking about other portions of scripture in the Bible. And it starts by saying, he who gathers in summer is a wise son. He who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. Now, as believers and followers of Jesus Christ, we understand that a son is also a daughter. So ladies, this does not exclude us. This includes us as well as believers, as followers of Christ. So let me read this again. He who gathers in summer is a wise son. He who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. I'm going to be talking about a spiritual aspect here of the harvest and in summertime to explain that. And I want to jump over to Matthew Let's see here, Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. And it's talking about the compassion of Jesus. And I'm going to read that for us right now, starting at verse 35 of Matthew chapter 9. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary. And another in, um, word there for weary is harassed. So the, the people were weary or the people were harassed and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. As the sons and the daughters of God, those of us who are followers of Christ, we are the laborers. We are the ones that know that the harvest is right now. And we need to be doing what Jesus was doing. He was teaching in the synagogues. He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He was healing sicknesses. We do that when we pray for each other in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he saw the multitudes. He was moved with compassion. Why? Because they were wearied and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. We know that Jesus is the good shepherd. We are his sheep. And as we follow him, 
as we turn our lives over to the Lord Jesus Christ, we're not perfect, that's for sure. But we, we, we learn from His Word, we get it into our hearts, and then we put it into action in our lives by living the change that Christ brings to us when we invite Him to be the Lord of our life and we follow Him. There are changes that come about in our life, the way we talk, the way we act, the way we react. And it's not always perfect, but we need to learn from the Lord so that we can be the salt and the light in this world, that we can be the encouragers, that we can share our testimony, that we can be this, this, this light and preaching the gospel, telling people what the Lord has done, what God has done through His Son, Jesus Christ. We need to be those people. We need to be the gatherers in the harvest now. We don't need to be slack. He who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame, because if we're a Christian, we need to spread the news. We need to, to tell the people where the bread of life is, where the living water is. We need to be those people so that we can be the one that gathers in the summer is a wise son and be those workers in the time of harvest, which is right now. We need to do that. We need to do that right now. And we need to pray as the body of believers, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, this here, therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. We need to be those disciples to do the great commission that Jesus talked about to his disciples. We need to be those people. We need to be talking about the harvest. We need to share our testimony, tell the gospel message, live our lives in the trust and the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be different than this world, because we are different. We're not perfect, but we know where the bread of life is and the living water, and we need to lead others to exactly that. When we follow the shepherd, they will too. I want to draw your attention to lovelife.org because it is a great ministry, wonderful ministry available in eight states now and it's expanding. And they help women who are pregnant. They help provide alternatives and they help provide a way for their children to have somebody in some place where they can grow up. And so I want to pray for them. Father, we pray for Love Life. This is a week that we've dedicated to them to highlighting their ministry and help them today, Lord, to help the women and the children in Jesus' name.